All right, I think we're ready to begin. My name is Dwayne Carpenter, and I am professor of Hispanic Studies and co-director of the Jewish Studies program at Boston College. And on behalf of the Jewish Studies program, the Department of Slavic and Eastern Languages and Literature, the Department of English, the Macmillan Museum, and the College Bookstore, I would like to extend a warm welcome to each of you on this memorable occasion. Not only will it soon be memorable for the literary feast to which we will be treated, and which I assure you will titillate your intellectual palates, and there are culinary refreshments awaiting you as well after the reading, but the date is also remarkable for the chronological coincidence of tonight's reading with momentous historical events. The most obvious are, of course, the end of World War I, quote, on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month, and it's much delayed canonization as Veterans Day. But I would also remind you that we have just commemorated and therefore been pierced anew by the jagged shards of Kristallnacht, the coordinated attack on November 9th and 10th, 1938, in which 99 Jews were murdered, tens of thousands arrested, and 267 synagogues vandalized and destroyed throughout Nazi Germany and Austria. November 11th also witnessed the blast off of the space flight Gemini 12 from Cape Kennedy, and rather earlier, three and a half centuries earlier to be precise, the Mayflower Compact was signed on this date by 41 pilgrims off the coast of Massachusetts. These seemingly disparate events are in fact connected by motifs of tragedy, immigration, exploration, survival, and renewal in unexpected circumstances and in unpredictable times. As you will soon see, tonight's deeply felt, vividly imagined, and elegantly expressed reading by our peripatetic man of letters is part and parcel of this tradition. The speaker this evening is Maxim Schreier, professor of Russian, English, and Jewish studies at Boston College. He is already well known to most of you, not only as a consummately engaging teacher, but also as an internationally acknowledged authority on Jewish-Russian literature perhaps most evident in his recent monumental two-volume anthology of Jewish-Russian literature, Two Centuries of Dual Identity in Prose and Poetry. This evening, however, he reads to us from his most recent collection of short stories, Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, published in September of this year by Syracuse University Press. I should like to conclude my introduction with two personal remarks. First, Maxime did not have to twist my arm for me to say nice things about him. <laughs> this is actually a, the result of a sports injury. <laughs> On the contrary, it is a genuine pleasure for me to be here and introduce you to you a prolific scholar, gripping raconteur, and deeply cherished friend. Second, I have learned over the years that when dealing with Maxime and his events, one must always expect the unexpected. Case in point. Last week, while delivering this stunningly attractive flyer that I think you've seen around the campus to various businesses and eateries on Harvard Avenue in Brookline, I was approached by an employee of one of these establishments. Upon seeing the title on the flyer, Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, this individual, whom I had never met formally, inquired as to whether I had been to Amsterdam. When I said no, I hadn't, this person's immediate response was, I haven't either, we should go there together. <laughs> Moral of the story, forget dating services, just deliver flyers for Maxime Schreier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to present Maxime, as I say, a cherished friend, consummate scholar, and the evening is yours. Good evening. Dwayne, first of all, thank you. That was really beautiful. In fact, this should have been the main story, and my story should have been the introduction. <laughs> that said, uh, I, I do want to add, and I think I speak on behalf of many of us, uh, that, Dwayne, your absence in Lions Hall feels like some sort of global disaster. And, uh, you know, you are dearly missed. And uh, the assassin that tried to, you know, do something to your right hand, I think, was attempting an intellectual assassination. But I know you're recovering, Dwayne. 
Yes, so, so uh, we await your complete recuperation and return from exile. Uh, I, of course, would like to thank all the departments and the individual colleagues who have organized this event. And above all, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. I know it's a busy time of the year and uh, a very busy time in the lives of students in particular. So to those here who are my students, I want to say that uh, while this will be covered on the final exam, uh, <laughs> we'll, we will have a review session. But do share your notes with friends. Patrick. I would like, in addition to one always thanks one's family, of course, for everything one is and one is not, but uh, um, I would like to say that uh, my father, who is here today, as you know, uh, David Shradipetrov, is a writer, and uh, he taught me to write. I didn't learn very well, I learned slowly. And uh, my mother taught me English, uh, uh, and for that I am immensely grateful. And of course, my wife Karen, my beautiful wife and uh, the mother of our daughters, uh, she's my most uh, critical and yet most uh, forgiving audience. Uh, the children are beginning to uh, sort of delve into these stories, and I actually uh, do not exaggerate. Mira, my older daughter, has been asking me about Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, she, and uh, today she told me, read to them from Amsterdam, so I, you will hear about Amsterdam. Uh, um, and lastly, um, uh, a remark that's bittersweet, but I'll, I'll say it anyways. Um, um, my grandmother, who's 95, is probably getting ready to go to the cafe upstairs. At least I hope it's a nice cafe upstairs and not some crummy donut shop. Uh, in fact, we almost canceled this event, uh, as some of you know. But uh, I think she wanted for me to do this reading. That's uh, how I explain this. So I'd like to dedicate this uh, to her. Um, she was very important when I was growing up, and uh, she was always very supportive of my writing. In fact, I think she's disappointed that none of my books has been turned into a screenplay. She always kept saying, Hollywood, Maxime, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, so basically, I don't know, perhaps <laughs> one day. Um, let me say a couple of words about this book. Basically, Dwayne already described it very eloquently. It's a collection of eight stories. They're not connected through narrative. They are, however, linked through the characters' uh, identities, their main aspirations, and obsessions and the historical circumstances that brought these characters into existence and then further pushed them out of the former Soviet Union uh, and uh, to uh, North America. The protagonists of all eight of these stories uh, are uh, Russian Jews or Jewish Russians. In all but one, these are immigrants whose identities are challenged not only by the experiences that immigrants face in general, but also by this uh, compulsion that Jews from Russia uh, experience to preserve a, a dual and therefore very fragile identity, both Jewish and Russian, culturally Russian, uh, ethnically, historically, and religiously Jewish. And this challenges my characters to various degrees to remain themselves while becoming others. Uh, and particularly, this is manifest in what many of these stories are about. They're about uh, love and desire, about uh, various amorous relationships that these uh, Jewish-Russian immigrants are involved in. Uh, and some of them are less happy than others, and some of them involve uh, non-Jews, and it's a subject that has been a perennial interest of mine, that is to say, what limits, what boundaries stand uh, between uh, lovers, and uh, very often there are, un are unsurmountable boundaries which have to do with our backgrounds, with our cultures, in this case with uh, Jewish background, the Jewish background of these characters. And lastly, um, how this collection came about. It came about slowly. Uh, I'm not a slow writer. In fact, uh, unfortunately, not a very slow writer. But I am a very slow rewriter and reviser. And uh, it's probably a shared experience of those who are working in a second uh, 
second acquired language that I think we feel somewhat vulnerable because we, of course, are na not native subjects of this language. And in my case, it pushes me to revise very, very slowly and very self-consciously until I have reached a certain condition when I don't think I have doubts. It doesn't mean that I don't have doubts, but at least I'm prepared to send a story into the world. But uh, one other twist to this scenario has to do with the fact that uh, three out of these eight stories began a long time ago as stories in the Russian language. The other five were written directly in English and uh, are more recent uh, for that reason. But what happened to these three stories that I had originally wrote, written in Russian when I was still actively write, writing in Russian was that over the years I rewrote them. Uh, these are not auto-translations uh, because in one case I added about 10 pages to a story which does not exist in its Russian antecedent. So in no way can you go back to the Russian and compare it. But uh, basically these are Anglo-American stories uh, with a Russian past. I guess that would be a way of describing them. Uh, what I'd like to do, just to give you, uh, you know, some sort of adequate sense of uh, how these stories work, I'll read a short excerpt from one story that had begun as a story in the Russian language, and then I'll read the beginning of the title story, which was written in English. Uh, the story uh, that I will read from first is called The After Love, and the coinage goes after the model of uh, the afterlife and why the after love. The story is essentially about the fact that myths of our childhood age as we age, and the realization of that can be very painful, if not devastating. And in this case, uh, the protagonist, who is uh, a Soviet Jew, growing up, uh, coming of age during World War II, uh, eventually revisits the myth of his past when he is already living in the sort of stagnant Soviet 1980s. The story opens in Moscow. It's the only story in this collection that takes place in Russia, and it's very deliberate because, of course, I spent my first 20 years, formative years, in Russia, and uh, it was important for me to include one story that does not have a uh, American uh, afterlife. Uh, and uh, so the protagonist reminisces about certain experiences that happened to him in 1945 when, after returning to Moscow from uh, evacuation, he found himself in a very experimental summer camp where kids had to procure their food by fishing and uh, mushroom gathering. And then the story shifts to the section I'll read, which is uh, sort of the late Stalinist years, the darkest years for Soviet Jewry, and it concludes in the early 1980s, but uh, you'll have to see for yourselves. Uh, so this section is from the middle of the afterlove. So I'll read that, and I'll read from Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, and um, I'll take some questions. This should take about an hour and a half, and so if you need to go home, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, the afterlove. After their return to Moscow, Pavlik didn't speak to Fedya Stok for almost two years. Fedya tried to regain his friendship a number of times, coming up to Pavlik during intercessions and at the cafeteria, sending classmates as messengers, writing apologetic notes and leaving them on Pavlik's desk in the classroom. Once, he came over after school with his coin collection as a peace offering, but Pavlik told him to go to weasel hell. But teenage memory eventually forgives even what it doesn't forget. And in junior high school, Pavlik and Fedya found themselves first on barely speaking terms and then increasingly friendly again, especially since they were now members of a circle of children of the intelligentsia, many of whom felt especially vulnerable in those anti-cosmopolitan times. And then they both fell in love with Alona Tarsis, in the summer after ninth grade. Alona was unlike all her peers in the all-girl high school where boys from their school were sometimes invited to dances and socials. She was different. She had blazing red hair and an inimitable smile. She carried about her an air that words could not describe, both summery and wintry, hot and cold, like the scent of a ripe cranberry unpicked and frozen on a bog. She had the tightest skirts of any girl they knew. Her weightless feet glided, not walked. She became, was the girl of their dreams. Alona shared a tiny room 
in a communal apartment with her mother, an actress at the Stanislavski Theater. The mother, Jedwiga, was Polish, a leggy blonde with bloodshot, pale blue eyes. She was always dressed in black or mousy gray. Her sibilants were screechy and hissy to a Russian ear. Before his arrest and death in a labor camp at Kalima, Alona's father, Itzik Tarsis, had been a professor of Yiddish at the Pedagogical Institute. He had published several books in a Yiddish-Russian dictionary. Public found the story of Alona's father particularly beguiling and even went so far as to compare in his mind with compare it in his mind with a lot of his own Jewish father, a war hero who had been killed fighting the Germans. Public's mother, Ida Ruvimovna, a gynecologist who worked in a clinic at one of Moscow's largest factories and had seen it all, was not keen on Alona. She's from the wrong family, was the verdict she gave public after Alona had been to their house for supper. But mother, her father was a professor, her mother is an actress, how much better does it get? Poles are anti-Semites, don't you know that? But her father was Jewish and a linguist. Well, he chose the wrong language, didn't he? Public's mother said under her breath, in any case, she's no good, this girl, she's trouble. Unlike his friend Pavlik Lidin, who was always direct and helplessly honest, Fedya Stok had been, even back then, a master of embellishment, a wizard of concealment. With a few strokes of fancy, he transformed Alona's father into a military officer who had shared the wartime fate of Pavlik's father and the fathers of a few other classmates. Fedya's parents liked the fact that Leona's mother came from the Szlachta, the Polish gentry. She's very good looking, a true Polish beauty, blue blood, Fedya's mother said after meeting Leona for the first time. Fedya's father, the rocket scientist, was almost never home in those days, and his mother was her son's advisor on matters ranging from flowers for a date to shaving cream. By the winter, of their 10th and last year of secondary school, Aliona and Fiedja had become a steady couple. Everyone expected that they would get married after graduation. Pavlik remained close to both, offering Aliona, if not love, then his brotherly protection. He had a local reputation as a fearless fighter and defender of children, many of them the bespectacled and violent carrying Jewish boys and girls from bullies and bigots. To Fedya, he could offer, among many other gifts, the comfort of knowing that Pavlik would never betray him, never, under any circumstances. There was something courtly in Pavlik's friendship with Alona and Fedya. Pavlik could act nobly toward his rival while also dying of love for Alona. Fedya sensed his friend's chivalric quality right away and put it to personal use. Pavlik gave him the keys to his room for afternoon rendezvous, and Fedya and Alona would cut school and spend time there alone with Pavlik's while Pavlik's mother was at the clinic. Pavlik helped Fedya punish an obnoxious fellow from Alona's building who once tried to grab her in a dark archway, or rather, Pavlik did the beating while Fedya stood by in his clean clothes looking like a referee at a boxing match. And it was Pavlik to whom Fedya turned for help when he got Alona pregnant. It was of all dates, April 1st, and public didn't believe him right away. Alona is pregnant? Very funny. And I've been accepted to Moscow University. They were standing outside public's apartment, its door covered with many layers of maroon paint. On the frame were doorbells of various sizes and shapes for the seven families that inhabited this communal labyrinth. Public, I mean it. She thinks she's almost three months pregnant. What am I going to do? Fedya looked scared. He was twitching his fingers, something public knew he did only when he was extremely agitated. Come in. Don't stand in the doorway. Public led Fedya into the long, narrow room he shared with his mother. So she's pregnant. Congratulations. You can name the son after me. Do you want to eat something? What? No, no, nothing for me, Fedya replied. What was she thinking? I don't know what to do now. What to do? Nothing. You'll just get married a little earlier, that's all. Public sounded almost relieved uh, that these months of uncertainty had come to an end. Married? A joke, right? Fedya sprang up from his chair. I cannot marry her. What are we going to do? Get married and have a baby? Be a goddamn young Soviet family? 
I've got to go to university, then to graduate school. I've got plans for my life, as do you, don't you? What's the matter, Pavlik? With his right hand, Pavlik grabbed Fedya by the front of his striped blue shirt at his throat. Get out of my house before I put your ass where your face is. Pavlik's face turned crimson as he dragged Fedya through the long communal corridor. Pavlik, wait, you're overreacting. We're friends, we tell each other everything, please. I never want to see you again, Ye you scum. Pavlik pushed Fedya out the door and slammed it. He went to the bathroom and sat there for a while, smoking the papyrosi that he kept hidden behind the main water pipe. Then he put on a coat made from his father's old Navy uniform and went outside. He wandered the wet streets until dark, taking in the fumes and smells of Vernal, Moscow, and trying to calm down. When he came home, he found Alona sitting on his bed. She was sipping tea from a faceted glass and quietly weeping, weeping and shaking. Next to her on the bed sat Pavlik's mother in a dark green dress with a brooch on her large chest. She had one of her arms around Alona and she was slowly stroking the girl's back and nape. My poor girl, Pavlik's mother kept whispering, all will be well, trust me. When all this happened, Alona's mother was away on a tour with a group of actors in her theater company. Pavlik's mother, who had had a quick change of heart toward Alona, helped her get an abortion at the, faculty, at the factory clinic. The rest of what happened followed suit. Alona flunked most of her graduation exams and didn't get her high school diploma that year. Pavlik applied to Moscow University to study physics, but didn't get in. The year was 1950. For the next five years, he studied at the Institute of Transportation, joining the ranks of the many unwilling Jewish Soviet engineers in training. Several nights a week, he unloaded freight trains to support himself and Alona, whom he married. They were childless, one of the many results of Alona's abortion. Another was her depression. Fedya Stok, who eventually slithered his way back into their lives, studied ethnography at Moscow University. He married late when he was already in graduate school. His wife, who had gone to high school with Alona, was the daughter of an Air Force general. Pavel Lidin remembered and relived all this. The older he was in the recollections, the faster the clip, as he was riding in the taxi cab that wet April night in Moscow. During the ride, he kept his eyes closed and warmed with his hands and lips the bloodless fingers of his sleeping wife. So that's the first section, and now I'll humor you with uh, the opening of the title story, Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, and uh, I don't really need to add anything to the background. Yom Kippur in Amsterdam. On a late September afternoon that looked misty from inside the skip hall terminal, Jay Glaz got off the Nice flight and decided to have lunch before taking the train into Amsterdam. Although it was only two o'clock, he was already worried about not getting enough to eat before sunset. It was the eve of Yom Kippur. His sole reason for stopping in Amsterdam was to avoid having to atone while in flight over fathomless waters. Jake Glaz, who used to be called Yasha Glasman, wasn't too keen on a two-day delay in his return home to Baltimore, where he ran a division of an international travel company. But there was nothing he could do. Yom Kippur, the Jewish atonement, the Jewish day of atonement, was the only holiday that Jake observed religiously. Devouring his second sandwich with Dutch herring that tasted nostalgically like red fish, the cured salmon from his Soviet childhood and youth, and washing it down with grosh, Jake recalled the vacation he had just spent with friends on the beach and promenade in Nice during the mornings and at the roulette tables in Monte Carlo in the evenings. He and Aaron had come up with the idea of a September trip to the Riviera during one of their weekend visits to Annapolis. Fluttering flags over the bay, oysters and blue crabs, cadets in celestial uniforms, yachts striating the horizon, 
attributes of summer by the sea always made Jake yearn for a Riviera vacation during the velvet season when the Mediterranean heat has subsided and the French vacationers have already gone back home after their annual August respite. Sweetums, Erin had said to him in her voice that was playful and yet knew no irony. Weren't you recently reading something about Nice? A story by Mr. Chekhov or was it by Mr. Nabokov? They had been together for almost two years and Jake loved her terminal innocence. He thought Erin was a classic American girl, German-Irish, smiley and lighthearted, thin and freckle-faced, all long legs and small breasts, sneakers, jeans, and big sweaters. He marveled at her capacity to live by common sense alone. He never fully understood how she could comfortably combine an in-depth knowledge of her immediate surroundings, her hometown, her fashion magazines, her government job, with a languid indifference to the larger picture of the world. It's not that Erin didn't want to learn. She actually managed to memorize all the occasional bits of Jewish history that he would share with her while driving someplace or in bed after lovemaking. Yet she was always content with the small slice of life that had been served her on a green paper plate. This trip was to have been Erin's first time on the Riviera, and Jake had wanted the trip to be an eye-opener. A travel expert that he was, he had never planned his own vacations as thoroughly as he did this time. Every day was to be a novelty for Erin. Lemon groves in Menton, high society in Monte Carlo, Picasso at Cap d'Antibes, and Renoir at Cannes-sur-Mer, movies in Cannes, perfumes in Grasse, fishing at Saint-Tropez. Jake had reserved a room in a quiet four-star hotel, the former residence of the Russian imperial consul, only a five-minute walk from Promenade des Anglais. By the end of April, every detail of their fortnight on the Riviera had been meticulously planned. Tickets and reservations had already been deposited in Jake's top desk drawer at work. And then came summer, even hotter and swampier than usually in the Baltimore area. And the closer he got to their departure date in September, the more he felt trapped in his own doubts. The whole thing all finally came together like a simple geographic jigsaw puzzle on his computer screen after a trip to Aaron's hometown in central Pennsylvania. Aaron's uncle pestered Jake with idiotic, kindly questions about Schindler's List. Her eldest sister referred to the yarmulkes of Hasidic Jews she had seen in Pittsburgh as beanies. And then, and then came Sunday when he spent the morning alone in the house playing with Nikki the duck's hunt while the entire family was in church. Aaron had never shoved her Catholicism down his throat. She knew he would choke, nor did Jake ever try to proselytize. He found the notion intellectually offensive and very un-Jewish. Yet the personal experiences of his friends who married non-Jews, as well as the various statistics he had obtained, suggested that Aaron would be likely to convert were he to ask her. He did finally ask her in the car on the way back to Baltimore, only to discover Aaron's stern loyalty to her faith, a loyalty that he had never imagined to be so absolute. Bovine tears glistening in her eyes, a ponytail pulled through the back of her navy baseball cap. Aaron stroked his hand on the gear shift and kept repeating again and again, Jake, I'll give you children. I'll help you raise them Jewish. I'll learn things, but I can't leave my faith. Why won't you accept me? Jake drove on silently, shaking inwardly with anger, tossing over in his head images of the Pope greeting a Sunday crowd in the Vatican, black and green plaid skirts on the subway in D.C., half a dozen Catholic weddings he had attended. He had previously lived his life believing that in a Christian world, a Jew ought to honor the ways of the majority without losing his own face. And now he had found himself so angered, so enraged with, so antagonistic toward the church as though it, had, it was somehow the, the church's fault that his future happiness now lay in ruins. 
Why can't you accept me for what I am? Erin asked him again on the phone a few days later. I do love you, Erin, but I just can't marry you. We're a small people. The mother of my children has to be Jewish. No matter how you slice it, Jake choked on his words. No pun intended, he added after a pause. Four or five days after that, on a Saturday morning, a lanky UPS lady delivered a box for a 20-inch television set. Inside the box, Jake found all two years' worth of his presents to Aaron returned in what looked like their original gift wrappings. It's some sort of a joke, he thought for an instant, instant unwrapping the half-full vial of the French perfume from Thanksgiving, unfolding the dark green wool wrap he had bought for her in London. His hands finally reached a thick pile at the bottom of the box. All his letters and even printed out emails, the faxes he liked to send her from work or sometimes from aboard the plane, and at least 20 postcards mailed from the destinations of his regular trips, Singapore, Naples, Moscow, and Sao Paulo, each mailing accurately torn in two, the whole thick pile tied with a blue silk ribbon and a note on top, Jake, I loved you more than anything, but not more than Jesus. One day, one day you'll understand. Please don't try to contact me. I've changed my phone number by air. On the floor, he sat amid presents now twice opened, gaping at the ceiling the way an insomniac gapes at his blousy wakefulness. Fortunately for Jake, his dearest Moscow friend, Mulya Borisov, even though a father of two girls and a pater familias, was still as adventurous as when he and Jake, still Yasha Glasman, then, had their youth and studenthood in common. Muli and his wife, Nadia, also an old friend from their high school Moscow gang, had quickly found cheap tickets and an inexpensive hotel in Nice, left their kids with their dacha-owning parents, and met Yasha for a week-long reunion on the Riviera. Jake was able to switch the return date of the vacation he had planned with Aaron to five days earlier, which ended up putting him in Amsterdam on the eve of Yom Kippur. Jake must have switched planes at Skip Hall a couple dozen times, but had never stayed in Amsterdam before. Here in Amsterdam, outside the central station, littered with raggedy British and Australian youths, the air was dense with fog. All colors were dimmed. There were more bicycles than pedestrians in the streets. Seagulls circled around garbage bins. And yet, there was something about this city that struck Jake right away as extremely livable and free-spirited. As he walked slowly to his hotel boat, anchored on the Amstel, he kept bumping into the signs of an old city culture. He observed to himself that the, citizen, the citizens of Amsterdam looked bourgeois, but not at all Philistine. He also gladly noted, and later wrote down in his journal, that young Dutch women in the afternoon crowd returned his inquisitive looks with a sensual readiness that revealed no fear of a stranger. What a beautiful place for a Jew to atone, Jake thought to himself and smiled. After checking into his hotel boat, Jake went to a cozy, glass-enclosed restaurant on Damrock and gorged on a delightfully unhealthy veal cutlet with thick slabs of fried potatoes. It was 4 o'clock, and he decided to start fasting at 6.30. That left him with more than two hours to sort out his many thoughts in anticipation of the annual Day of Atonement. So it's Yom Kippur, Jake told himself, finishing a second beer. Have I sinned? Was breaking up with Aaron a sin, or was it a mitzvah? How can I atone if I haven't sinned? Am I a Jew only because I couldn't, wouldn't marry Aaron? Jake knew he wasn't thinking straight. After the sleepless night, he had spent partying and partying with his Russian friends in Nice, the early morning flight, and the beer he had drunk since having arrived in Amsterdam. He knew he wasn't aiming his mind in the right direction, but couldn't help it. What he wanted from the nearing Yom Kippur were some real answers. He began to blame himself for ending it with Aaron so abruptly. I should have taken it slower, 
given her more time to come to grips with my reasons. The foggy air outside the restaurant changed color from blue to putty. Jake asked for a cup of coffee. Maybe I should have simply married her. And to hell with the whole Jewish thing, he remembered his first dinner date with Aaron in a seafood place in Baltimore's inner harbor. She didn't sleep with him for an entire month, and he almost didn't mind the deferring of sex. So much did she make him relish the prolonged foreplay. Jake suddenly felt all alone in the city of Amsterdam, craving a woman's company. He summoned the bulbous waiter, and acting a lot more drunk, asked, where's your vicious red light district? I've got to check it out. Not one bit surprised, the waiter came back with a pocket map of central Amsterdam, resembling a page from the Atlas of Human Anatomy. Blue veins of canals, black nerves of main streets, red muscles of bridges. Cross Dumb Rock and go straight, you can't miss it. The waiter bowed, accepting Jake's payment and tip. Some incomprehensible magnetism navigated Jake's body through an evening crowd on main streets, then down a long, deserted alley laid with cobblestones. A few minutes later, he found himself strolling along a narrow, seedy canal in the company of other men, walking by themselves or in groups of two or three. A couple would occasionally flit by. Jake even spotted a family of tourists with two children, a boy and a girl, dressed in yellow rain jackets. Some visitors took pictures, flashes from their cameras sinking to the bottom of the canal. On both sides of the canal stood gothic-looking buildings, murky and narrow. Each had several, several glass doors. Jake was initially embarrassed to peer closely at those doors. He walked back and forth for a while, observing what seemed to be a nightly routine in this extraordinary neighborhood. He had read and heard about Amsterdam's red light district, but never imagined it to be so peaceful, so devoid of the filth and crime that he would attribute to such areas in most other cities. Some of the glass doors had screens or blinds, and burgundy red lanterns shone from behind the doors, an indication that the hostess was busy with a customer. It was chilly and dank out, so only occasionally did he see an open door and a woman in lacy lingerie standing in the doorway. For the most part, the women stood behind closed glass doors, smiling and waving, enticing the visitors. Street lamps alongside the canal gave out yellow gassy light. Framed by the glass doors, the women's figures looked like fading old portraits. Jake identified the local business code a little tap, the door half opens, bargaining, if any, the curtain falls, and the red magic lantern comes alight, visible through the chinks in the blinds. He could make out his own reflection on the canal, a large, meaty chin, reddish stubble, equiline nose, thick, curly eyebrows, deep-set brown eyes. He finally made his choice. The brass knob looked like it had just been polished, a good almond, Jake said to himself. He leaned against the door, licking his dry lips and wiping his perspiring forehead with a white handkerchief. Inside, from beyond the glass, a blonde woman in her mid-twenties studied her next customer. Then She then pursed her thin lips and unlocked the door. Come upstairs. It's chilly down here. I've turned the heat up. The prostitute spoke clean English with just a residue of a Germanic accent that dulled her consonants. She wore white silk panties and a bra adorned with oxblood lace. Jake watched her ascend the stairs like a slinky Siamese cat. She had slim hips and a small boyish behind. Her breasts were ample for her height and figure, and her hair was dyed. It's 70 guilders for a fuck or a suck you pay first. Jake was amazed by the sheer automatism with which this pale face commanded him. He opened his wallet and paid. The woman stashed the money away, rolled down her underwear, then undid her bra and laid it out carefully on a wooden chair. The room was lit by four large red candles, each burning in a corner. The bed was narrow and covered with an oriental bedspread. A glass-topped coffee table, two chairs, bare 
painted walls, a mirror mounted on the ceiling above the bed. Jake stepped in place, unsure what was next. What are you waiting for? You can take your clothes off. Jake blushed to the roots of his hair. I have some water. My mouth is very dry. He sounded like a teenager buying cigarettes. I don't usually do that for customers, but I'll make an exception for you. Please don't break the cup. The prostitute filled a blue porcelain cup with tap water. It's a gift. Jake greedily gulped the water down. Water tastes good here. Thank you. He was now sitting on the edge of the bed, she in the chair, directly across, having a smoke. Listen, I don't quite know how to tell you this, Jake interrupted the silence. I don't really want to have sex. I'm feeling kind of lonely. Do you think we could just talk for a while? I knew you were one of those from the way you stared. It's the same if we walk, if we talk or fuck, as long as the money keeps coming. If you want to stay for 30 minutes, that would be 100 guilders more. That's pretty steep. Jake took out his wallet again and counted the foreign bills twice. The prostitute put on a purple sweatshirt and set an alarm clock. What's your name? Jake asked, now feeling more at ease with his hostess. It's Annette. You Dutch? No, German, from Hamburg. What brings you to Amsterdam? Sorry, dumb question. I take it back. Jake shrugged his shoulders, which was his way of showing regret. And what brings you to Amsterdam, Annette retorted. Jake's first instinct was to tell her about Aaron, his trip to Nice, about spending Yom Kippur in Amsterdam, but something stopped him. I'm doing a piece on tourism in the city. I'm a writer. Jake was surprised by the way this almost lie came out. It seems that half of my clients are writers. Can't you come up with a better lie? <laughs> Actually, it's not my business, the prostitute interrupted him. You're Jewish, aren't you? She said and looked him straight in the eyes. How did you know? You look Jewish. How can you tell? Back in the States, very few can. My father was Jewish. You have the same sadness in your eyes, even when you smile. My father used to say, it came from many centuries of being outcasts. Is your mother German? Yes. She and my dad are circus gymnasts. I used to perform until age 17. I want to ask you something, Annette. How can you do this? Do what? She lit another cigarette and parted her legs. Well, this, I mean, doesn't it bother you that you sleep with all sorts of strange men for money? Please don't get me wrong. I'm not a moralist, but still, what's there to understand? It's a job. The money's good, living is cheaper in Amsterdam. I'm saving a lot. What are you going to do with it? First of all, I'd like to buy a nice apartment in the south of France. There's a lot I want. The alarm went off, sounding like a fireman's siren. Jake got up and put on his long raincoat. Well, many thanks for your time. He stopped in the middle of the room and wanted to shake her hand. I don't shake hands with men at work. No offense. She smiled for the first time. Well then, let me ask you one more question. Okay, but make it short. Did your parents have a good marriage? I mean, did it matter to them that one was Jewish and the other was not? I'm afraid you will have to come again if you want to know more. <laughs> Plus, I'm not sure I wish to talk about it. Just remember, Difference is only good when you can comprehend it. Annette opened the door and turned the staircase lights on. Don't forget your umbrella. It's pouring outside. She was right. Squalls of rain washed over cobblestones, filling the canals with autumn quicksilver. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions if any. Please. Uh, what made you decide to do this like eight short stories as opposed to just one whole short story? I guess like what inspired you to really like do this type of this collection? Well, it came about slowly for reasons that I think I mentioned earlier, which uh, have to do with my whole experience writing creatively in the English language. Uh, I didn't come to that to, uh, well, 
it's a long story, uh, which uh, I won't bore you with, but uh, the short version of it is that I made my first attempts to write fiction in English actually soon after coming to America. Uh, it was pure luck. I had already been writing quite a bit of Russian poetry and uh, had almost a manuscript of what would become my first collection of Russian poetry. And also, I had written some fiction in Russian. I became a transfer student at Brown in the fall of 1987. Uh, I heard that there was a famous American writer teaching fiction at Brown. He was John Hawkes, uh, who was retiring that year, who, as some of you know, was really uh, a major literary figure from the pleiad of American postmodernists that also included Stanley Elkin, uh, Robert Coover, Donald Barthlemy, uh, William uh, Gaddis, basically, uh, uh, except I didn't know much of that. But I did pick up a copy of Second Skin uh, at the Brown Bookstore and couldn't get through it very easily because I didn't know half the words, I swear. Uh, it's dense. Uh, but basically, I introduced myself to Hawks, who was uh, an old Anglo-Saxon gentleman uh, very, very beautifully, elegantly spoken uh, and had the facade that deceived you because most of his work was deeply perverse, uh, deeply, deeply perverse. Uh, he asked me if I had read Nabokov and I had. Uh, he, he had a love affair with Nabokov, considered him the greatest stylist. And the long and short of it is that he accepted me as a 13th student in his seminar on fiction writing, which had a waiting list of two years, and he was retiring. So I was very lucky. But uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we didn't, we parted as friends, but he was disappointed in me because at the time, all I wanted to write was, poli you know, uh, politics, the Soviet Union, you know, uh, anti Semitism. Whereas he had this idea, he kind of had me pegged as uh, someone who would write perverse, erotic stories set in the Russian countryside, sort of like. <laughs> Sort of like the Jewish Russian Angela Carter, and uh, no, I and I remember specifically having a Belgian beer, a tall bottle of Belgian beer, with him in a restaurant on Hope Street called Rue de l'Espoir, of all things, and arguing that I had no desire to write about these things. He would have, he's probably glad now, you know, that at least you know I've written about some sexual matters. But basically, I wrote, I wrote a couple of pieces for Hawks' seminar, but they were so horrible and disappointing that uh, I didn't really sit down and write a first story in English that I consider somewhat satisfying until the spring of 1995 when I defended my doctoral dissertation and knew I would have a tenure track position and I sort of gave myself a break from academic affairs. I had been already writing essays in English for quite a while and translating into English but basically didn't write my first self-conscious story in English until 1995. And after that, I kept writing them. And then basically, you know, when my children were born, when my wife Karen was pregnant with our uh, older daughter Mira, I felt that, you know, it was time to put food on the children's table. So I finished my first uh, creative book in English, Waiting for America, which uh, came out in 2007. And then I immediately began to work on this collection and putting it together and revising and polishing. And basically, that's uh, what happened. But I was very keen to represent here not only my interest as a fictionist, uh, but also, I suppose, my uh, literary genealogy, which is why three stories here uh, have Russian language antecedents. Uh, they have a certain Russian ar ar archaeology, but the others do not. Thank you. That's a great question. Please. It's an excellent question. It's happened to me, but it, but it hasn't hap It doesn't happen as often as I wish, uh, and I think it happens more in writing poetry, at least in my experience. To me, the experience of writing prose is a lot more uh, conscious of writing in time and writing in narrative. Although, the piece that I read first this evening. Uh, which has from the story of the afterlove, 
which has to do with the, the life of these characters as late teenagers in 1950. That whole piece, plus a few other pages that I didn't read, I composed in one sitting, in one day, when I realized that the story w was not working well in English for reasons that it was missing something about the characters er early adult or, or late adolescence that was absolutely essential to the English story, but less to the Russian. Because certain things are implied in the way that the Russian reader is familiar with these things uh, uh, much more intimately. But that kind of came to me. The story was published in, the, in Kenyan Review, and in fact, uh, uh, I remember that very clearly, precisely because I submitted it and uh, they accepted it, which doesn't happen very often to me, at least. Uh, in this, <laughs> you know, usually, usually stories get rejected. Uh, yeah, so it must, have, uh, it must have been a good occasion. Yeah, that's a great question. That's it? Okay, well, I, I thank you so much for being here. Oh, there is a question. Have you ever been to Amsterdam? Yes, I've been to Amsterdam, I think, three times. It's, it's wonderful. Which, which part? Uh, <laughs> the, you know, Anna Frank House, the, you know, <laughs> the Van Gogh Museum. <laughs> Dwayne, how, how could you? <laughs> of all people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, not with any regularity. Occasionally, uh, if asked to write something, but I am very actively involved in, at the moment, in the Russianing of, uh, of my book, Waiting for America, which has been translated into Russian, and I worked very closely with the translators. Uh, and uh, there are plans for this book as well to be translated, except I face a major dilemma, which is what to do with the three stories that have Russian antecedents, and I am not sure, because in a way it would require a reverse reconstruction, and uh, that reconstruction has such a museumist quality that I almost prefer that they be translated anew uh, from the English text, uh, but uh, that's what I uh, am involved with. Uh, yeah, but also, you know, I speak Russian with my parents and my children every day, and uh, that's no small feat, you know. Yeah. Um, from your personal experience, what has been like the distinct, I don't know, more enjoyable or more challenging aspect of writing in English or writing in Russian? Well, you see, um, <laughs> because it's not a simultaneous experience in my life. That is to say, this bilingualism of mine is, uh, in fact, I don't think there is simultaneous perfect bilingualism. I don't, I don't think it exists. And even the writers who have been bilingual did not write simultaneously and equally well in both languages. Nabokov practically gave up uh, writing fiction in Russian and only wrote a few poems in Russian while writing in English. And uh, it's usually the price. Uh, Beckett did not write simultaneously in English and French. Uh, so it's an imperfect or partial bilingualism. But I think, uh, you see, people come to writing in second languages for different reasons and under different circumstances. I think in my case, the circumstances have been more organic and natural. I simply grew and uh, the language grew with me and I grew into it. And with it. I remember I, a few weeks ago I had an exchange with a colleague of mine who is a, a Jewish scholar from Ukraine who lives in England and who writes poetry in Russian. Very good. And she was somehow, she said, I'm really sorry that you're writing in English because you, you would have written so well in Russian. You would have been writing so well. And I don't remember. I was tired or busy. And I said something like, you know, we don't choose our language. The language chooses us. And I think she, 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 she took it literally. But I, I, do, I do think there is something to that, in a sense. But of course, there are circumstances when people embrace the second languages for reasons of exile, for reason of, reasons of politics, for reasons of family, uh, you know, choices. And uh, I can't speak to them personally. I think I have an understanding of them theoretically. But, uh, you know, uh, all I can say is that uh, uh, I used to have this ambition when I was 
still a student and a graduate student, to know every word in English that I know in Russian and every word in Russian that I know in English and to be able to go back and forth somehow facilely and seamlessly. Uh, but of course, this is a youthful ambition. And I think what, what, you, what you grow to learn is that uh, the second language is, uh, it's not that it's a perfect or imperfect tool. I'm frankly not particularly interested in this whole discourse. I think Nabokov poisoned everybody in, the, in what he said about his, his English language, that it was third rate or fourth rate. It's, it was first rate. It was better than first rate. That's not the point. The point is that I think it forces you to distance yourself from your past and to make a certain pact with your past. That is the tragic side of it. The, I think the, the, the writing itself is, is infinitely exciting. I think it's the identity, uh, linguistic politics, that is challenging, if uh, I could put it this way, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Dick. No, what I was, what I was saying is, in this, the first piece I read, you see, in the Russian language antecedent, um, that whole middle part was absent. Uh, and I felt that, uh, except a few fleeting allusions retrospectively created, because I felt that these dark years for Soviet Jews and in general the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, the late post-war years of Stalinism, is the material that is, tends to be quite well understood, especially by uh, Jewish Russian readers, uh, uh, many of whom lived through it. And so it would have felt to me like uh, articulating necessary truisms uh, in Russian. But in English, it felt like some sort of discovery. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, but then again, I can't be the judge of this. Uh, you, you, you can. Yeah, Svetlana. Like, would you say that you like moderate, model your style in writing after any specific author like relate to it or any of that, whether it's a Russian author or an American author? It's a very good question. Well, I don't want to be coy, so let me tell you. Uh, certain things I knew and other things I have come to realize. Uh, and I, I've written about some of these things in Waiting for America. Of course, when I was leaving Russia, I knew that there was a amazing writer who, uh, whose literary edifice is equally important to Russian and Anglo-American culture. That was Nabokov. I just knew that. Uh, it doesn't mean that I, I attempted to take lessons from him. I think uh, Nabokov doesn't have good imitators, uh, he's inimitable, but at least uh, uh, I identified very closely with him, uh, also some biographical coincidences. Uh, the writers that I think I apprenticed with in some ways include Isaac Babel, uh, include in English Malamud, whom I admire greatly. Uh, um, um, I lately came to feel, which is strange, that I must have been quite influenced, and I think this, the first piece I read uh, probably suggests that, by the work of uh, the great uh, post-war Russian writer Yuri Trifonov, who actually, were, whose father was a Red Cossack and mother was a daughter of a Jewish Bolshevik, and who had, uh, uh, at the time of his death in 1981, a strong contender for the Nobel Prize in Russian literature, some of his work is well known in English, but I think somehow uh, something about his rummaging through uh, characters' ruminations uh, helped me, I think, in my own pursuits. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, one could go on about this. Uh, <laughs> you can study very well, but it uh, doesn't mean that you learn much. You study very hard, yeah. Uh, so thanks, Svetlana. That's a great question. Yusha. This is my cousin, Julia, yeah. Very good question. Well, the nonfiction I have written 
as opposed to critical essays, which some people call nonfiction. Uh, so I, I'll speak about my literary memoir, Waiting for America. Uh, it is a literary memoir. In, uh, it's steeped in uh, historic events and the past of uh, my uh, autobiographical character and my family uh, after leaving the Soviet Union and before coming to America. But it's told, I think, in a style and in, through devices that are more akin to creative fiction than to nonfiction. And in fact, fundamentally, to me, the distinction that uh, today's uh, uh, American culture makes uh, or this kind of wall, iron wall, that separates fiction and nonfiction is largely uh, misplaced because devices of great nonfiction and of great fiction are virtually the same. The difference is not about in devices, it's in the material, in the, the extent to which historical truth is reconstructed. So I don't know what I enjoy more. Uh, I've just finished a prequel to Waiting for America, which I now am going to revise. I just finished, which goes back to the beginnings of my life and ends with leaving the Soviet Union. And that's uh, a, uh, definitely a memoir, but I'm also working on some fiction. Uh, it's harder to work on fiction in snatches, I'll say that. Uh, with little children, I've gotten used to working in snatches, and when you're working on, say, a memoir you can do, you, I'm happy if I write three pages in the morning. That makes me a happy person. But, you know, three pages of a short story is not a whole lot. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. How yeah. come the Jews think that they're well acquainted with anti-Semitism in the Kutis uh -huh. in the Soviet Union? They keep thinking that they were not born at that time. Well, you don't know my age, first of all. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, these things are not exactly unknown. They can be studied, uh, and uh, <laughs> you know, if we only if we only fictionalize what we experience personally, it would make for a dull existence. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, peculiarly enough, I have not written anything in the fictional vein that has to do with the anti-Semitism in the time when I grew up. Uh, you see, so I don't know how to answer your question except that. Uh, well, look, I think. The last years of Stalin and that period is particularly telling and particularly threatening and therefore particularly appealing in a way uh, for a fictionist. Um, yeah, so that would be my answer. Please. You mentioned that you are a fast writer but a slow reviser. Yeah, oh, you don't want to know. I just. <laughs> It's awful. I hate to revise, precisely because once I get into it, I go through so many drafts, and I'm still not happy. And uh, um, that's basically what I do. And I revise in longhand. I print things out, and I sit with them. And then the thing I particularly detest is having to enter the corrections. Uh, I, I know some novelists who have research assistants do that. I actually do not know how they do that. How, because basically, it's as though you remove yourself from a very, very important part of the process. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, no secrets, except that uh, I feel that for me to reach some sort of vintage, it takes longer than for your average you know, crummy wine. And, uh, uh, it, it ages and ages. Um, I'm still finding things here. And the reason I say, I just heard that it's going into the second printing, and so they, they asked for the core agenda, these little corrections. And my God, once I start looking, <laughs> you know, I, I correct and correct. Please. It's a very interesting question. Well, I think what is unique about the Russian immigrant experience, or specifically for the, what's unique about the Jewish Russian immigrant experience is that the span of Jewish history in Russia is very short as compared to 
the span of Jewish histories in the rest of Europe, Russia doesn't gain its Jews until the partitions of Poland, which is you know the end of the 18th century. So uh, just imagine the history of Jews in Spain or in Italy, right? <laughs> or the history of Jews in Russia. It's a very recent history. But the brevity of its span is compensated for by its tremendous, tremendous turbulence and violence and intensity and uh, the extent to which Jews uh, tried and tried to storm their way into Russian culture and into the mainstream. Uh, and uh, all of these things play into, uh, you know, the uh, shape of uh, the Jewish-Russian immigration. But of course, look, uh, this is a whole, it's a whole huge subject. I just want to say the Refusnik experience alone is absolutely unique because the Refusnik experience for Jews uh, is unlike any uh, experience for Jews in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s anywhere because it was essentially uh, a form of, uh, it was a form of uh, uh, containment bordering on genocide. And uh, because of that, uh, you know, people come with huge baggage, which many of them are in denial of and uh, take some years to unravel, uh, you know, these things. Uh, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah. Professor Carpenter, are we to stop? But there's, there's one person, okay. Professor Carpenter. Let's take one more question. Yes, please. Yeah. But I, well, can I say about what? Is there positive dynamics today? Oh, okay. Well, look. Studies suggest that anti-Semitism, that popular anti-Semitism is down. How can it not be positive? It must be positive. Uh, but also the numbers have shrunk, you know. It's a real, real marginal minority. Uh, 300,000, it's a very, well look, Argentina has what, 200,000, 250,000 Jews. It doesn't feel like a small minority, but in Russia now it does. So the sheer numbers are such that it's not making me particularly optimistic about the future of Jews in Russia as uh, a self-reproducing, culturally vibrant group. Uh, but at the same time, look, on any day, I would choose a day free of anti-Semitism over a day free of uh, cultural vibrancy. So uh, that's, I guess, my brief answer. Yeah. Thank you so much.